Praise the Lord, saints. I felt life and reality in the worship tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. So we are entering into another week of what they call a Bible conference. The advertisement I noticed could be a conference of the person of Jesus. That'd be a good one, that conference of the work of the cross, conference of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I was thinking tonight, uh, we desire to get the good out of the scriptures. We, as new creation beings, are nourished on the word of God. And uh, Meister Eckhart said a long time ago in his old German dialect, Viltu, den Kernen haben, so musst du die Schalen brechen. Would you have the sweet nut meat? Then you must break the shell. <laughs> Let's pray all to God, uh, all pray to God that we break the shell this week. How many know there's good in the book? There's good in the covenant. <laughs> Tiasa Sparks talks about standing in the good of Christ's uh, redemptive work. But how many know also sometimes you have to break the shell? something to break through. Praise the Lord. You know, if, uh, if I ever start a local church, I'm going to name it the Church of the Feeble Folk. <laughs> and uh, I just thought a few minutes ago about an Old Testament scripture that says the conies are but a feeble folk. <laughs> Yet make they their houses in the rocks. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I was talking to a Catholic mystic in Dearborn, Michigan, just before I came to Pinecrest. Most remarkable man. Never met a man like him in my life. He was a modern descendant of the Phoenicians or the Canaanites. He was a Semitic Maltese. And he said to me, I am a little fish. I must stay back in the cleft of the rock. If I venture out into open water, something big will gobble me up. So we need to uh, find our place in the Lord, don't we? And let him make us safe and secure from all alarms. How many know there are lots of alarms in the world today? I have elected to choose a, uh, a scripture out of the epistle of James tonight. I don't think it much matters where you go in the Word of God. It's all the Word of God, isn't it? Amen. God speaks in all of it. When we're young, we're idealistic and have high ideas about being led by the Spirit. I tend to become very vague and foggy up at the upper reaches. And uh, my friend Robert McMillan, whom some of you have heard preach here, has got a real touch of fire. He wrote a letter to Arthur Byrd in England one time, said, Brother Byrd, I'd like to go with you on a trip sometime. Two weeks later, Arthur Byrd was knocking on his door. So Robin and Arthur started off together from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Robin said, Gosh, Brother Byrd, I, I wonder where the Lord wants us to go. I wonder if he wants us to go north or south. Arthur said, I don't think the Lord much cares where we go. <laughs> you know, you can never get an absolute assurance that you're just exactly where you are in relation to some objective concept of the will of God. But how many of you know that wherever you are, whether it's right or whether it was a mistake, you can meet God there. And God can begin to make everything right. <laughs> I don't worry much whether I'm in the will of God or not. And most of the time I even feel like I'm in the will of God. Sometimes wild emotional feelings can make me feel very uneasy and out of place. But that's in relation to this world. It's because I'm not made for this world. <laughs> it's not because I shouldn't be at Pinecrest tonight and should be down in New York City preaching or someplace. It's the fact that I'm out of joint in this whole world. Praise the Lord. And the two worlds count in our, our teaching tonight, in our little simple biblical text. How many know there's a kingdom of light and there's a kingdom of darkness, John's gospel teaches us. And there's a king over each one, God and, and Satan. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. And you know, I thought it would be good this week 
if somebody would sing special songs might I ask someone to prepare some special songs for this week uh, one thing we have at Pinecrest is a lot of freedom we have too much according to many thinkers I get assailed on that quite often as I travel so lo and behold after you have all this freedom nobody does anything we turn into fatalistic moderns we sit and bound by a spirit of fatalism and, and spiritual paralysis and everybody that wanted to do things every place else where they weren't allowed to come where you can and they don't isn't that a mystery of human nature and you don't have to be an operatic of operatic quality to sing unto the Lord and glorify him even joyful noises fully acceptable around a throne there must be a great filter there that passes through and sounds good praise the Lord well uh, tonight I'm naturally a thematically foggy person and the last person in the world God should have called to preach I wrestled with it six years and tried to get out of it I finally sat up in a fourth story with a great man of God one day trying to either prove or disprove my call and I said brother so-and-so do you believe I am called to preach and he said and I was kind of hoping to get out of it and before my life got too old and all my chances were gone I could throw this burden off and become a success in the world and make some money you know and so I was you know quizzing and hoping to get a, a very authoritarian know that I could stand on and shed the burden of the call to preach so I said brother so-and-so do you believe I am called to preach we were sitting in an intimate conversation up in the attic of his house which was a big old Victorian mansion and so I said brother so-and-so do you believe I'm called to preach he said unquestionably <laughs> with all of his rhetorical power that he had so I was established <laughs> finally praise the Lord uh, James epistle is probably the most accessible book in the whole New Testament it may have been the first written it in fact dominated church thinking for 1,000 years so this is a, the epistle of a millennium it, it established the tone of thought in the church for 1,000 years and it's not high like Ephesians or Romans or the Gospel of John It's low and humble and I suppose we could use something low and humble once in a while don't you uh, after you survive on pastries and candies for a while you just get sick of those things and you long for bean soup and bread even stale bread and so let's look at James epistle I'm going to look at chapter one in a a broad way tonight centering on three or four different areas I feel like the man who said uh, my religion is to think the unthinkable thought to say the ineffable or the unsayable or unpronounceable word to do the impossible deed and to walk the impossible way and uh, we feel that and I think that may be why there's not more prophesying done it's that the spirit of prophecy is present but we don't know how to say what's in our hearts we have something in our hearts how many of you have something in your heart and you know it but to tell it all out is very difficult to get that language that just matches the sentiment is so difficult that perfect marriage that you must have for expression and uh, I, I feel often the spirit of prophecy present but nothing is said I think that's one reason why we are attempting to say the unsayable or we're diverge uh, of a new required historical breakthrough in in the drama of uh, uh, salvation history praise God hallelujah how many have felt like you're at the verge of something you've got to get into it it beckons you it's Amen. it's sweet and it's like the promised land it has forbidding giants and walls and it has barriers but uh, we'll try this little simple scripture tonight and see if we can get simple things that are practical or practical use in the kingdom I'll begin with verse number two my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing this that the testing of your faith worketh or produces patience I guess I'll read a passage here but let patience have her perfect work or full outworking that ye may be perfect and entire 
lacking nothing. This is a day of lack, isn't it? We, we feel great vacuums that cry to be filled. It's a day of spiritual hunger. Am I right or am I wrong? There's a hunger in the land today. And uh, Brother Taylor says true ministry is nothing other than feeding hunger, and I like that. We need to be purged of a lot of uh, rigid forms. We need to have a lot of this ecclesiastical starch taken out. We need to be able to meet truly as a family of God and become much more functional as individual members of the body of Christ. Amen. And this ideal has been before us 30 years and we haven't got far. But there may be reasons for why we haven't got far. We may be opposed by mighty forces who have seen we're moving in the right direction, being inspired and directed by the very wisdom of God himself. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that kind of a man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded mind, uh, uh, that kind of a man who is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I will pause there, feeling that verse 8 would be a natural stop. I remember, I think, Ed Corley standing behind uh, this pulpit, or the one that preceded about six or seven years ago in his meticulous way unfolding the Greek text here and telling us that his local church had been involved in verse 2 and uh, chapter 1 for a long, long time. But no matter how you look at it, this stands as a tremendous challenge, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I have never yet mastered that divine discipline, have you? <coughs> We Americans, uh, being of a materialistic culture and being a pampered sort of people, we're taught to respond positively when things go well and sharply uh, negative when things don't go well. We are a nation of complainers. And so I have been thinking about this for a number of years and uh, considering the challenge of it. How can we count it all joy when you fall into various trials? Well, I found a key. In the first place, I, I suppose we should start with utter simplicities, and I have a terribly hard time getting down to simplicities, which means that it's hard to start anything. You've got to get down. Uh, Brother Tom Worth on Sunday morning directed our minds to a marvelous scriptural passage in St. Luke chapter 6, where Jesus talks about a man who digged deep in fact, I might go back to that passage. Uh, I believe that one of the natural enemies of spirituality is hurry and rush. In fact, uh, if I could teach the whole church, uh, all the young men and young women are going to be preachers, uh, I would say to those people, uh, what would you tell me, Brother Wilbur? I'd say, all right, when you read the scriptures, read them slowly. And read every word as it's written in your particular translation unless you have specific didactic reasons for changing a word to make the meaning clearer. Uh, we modern Americans are too much in motion. They say there are 25 million Americans flying through space right now, either in cars or planes or buses or ships. And it's good that we tonight are sitting in our chairs more or less like Paul. Jesus Christ appeared on the Damascus Road and his name was Saul, and later his name turns up to be Paul, and I found out you can interpret Paul as arrested. Paulos is as related to paus, which is a modern word, pause. Jesus Christ arrested Paul on the road to Damascus. He arrested him. God likes arrested men. The mad dash of humanism to be arrested and even, even stopped. I thought of the virtue of living a life like Abraham, sitting out and uh, a tent for a uh, hundred years in the wilderness. 
Not always being uprooted and being here and being there and being tempted by this and wanting to buy that and going on the installment plan and getting broken by compound interest. Where is he? Oh, he's sitting out in his tent. How long is he? 75 years he's been out there sitting. Well, you'll never find anything that way. Well, Jehovah walked up to his tent door one day. That's all. <laughs> Two other angels. <laughs> You know, they say build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to you or build and make a, the world's best candy and you can sell it in Podunk or Zeblomevich and they'll come and find you and buy it. And, well, Abraham's heart longed and yearned and loved and worshipped and Jehovah found him out there. Glory! And the New Testament writers as some have entertained angels unawares. Glory! <laughs> I want a better hallelujah than that. Yes, grip. Faith means grip. Pardon me for my unorthodox ways. It was prophesied upon me. <laughs> 20 years apart. Prophesied in Pittsburgh in 1959 or 60. Prophesied down in the room by Brother Moore a few years ago. Hallelujah. And um, maybe in my teaching tonight, if I get, have time, I'll get to talking about the original you. Personality is unrepeatableness. Praise God. Oh, yes, Luke chapter 6. Hallelujah. We're on an eternal time clock. And it's not shaped like a circle. <laughs> it goes somewhere. Do you ever find yourself imprisoned by the circle? Modern man is dominated by watches and wheels and gears, and it's all around. Do you ever notice that? A circle is a natural prison. When man gets into the wilderness and gets lost, he walks in a circle. Why? Because everybody has unequal legs. And when you lose your goal, uh, your vision or your goal, then your natural body form takes over and you go in a circle. And if your legs are way different, you go in a small circle. And if they're very equal, you go in a big circle. And that's been proven. That's a fact. I'm giving you facts. Maybe trivia, but facts. They may be able to turn into spiritual symbols where they take on fantastic power. God, my God, is a simple God. He, he loves his children. He's a father. He will do everything to meet you. If you don't meet God, it means you have taken very elaborate pains to elude him. One thing that marvels me at James's epistle, this severe James, who grew up in a house with a man called Jesus of Nazareth, James makes it look that God gives wisdom really e very easily. Anybody like wisdom? That's God. Oh, I thought you had to go on five forty-day fasts. <laughs> That's faith. Faith reaches in directly. Praise God. Luke chapter six. I need a rock for ballast to hold me down here. There's a rock down here somewhere. Jesus says in verse 46, and again, as last week, I, I say unto you, I'm not here to correct you, to radically alter your course, unless you're not saved, then you better change your course. And people find out they're not saved after they've been in church a long, long time, I found out. Reverend Beecha, Reverend Beeman Testified at Catherine Coleman's a great deal in the late 50s. Pastored a Methodist church 50 years and then got saved. Met Jesus after 50 years. It was worth it, wasn't it? <laughs> he was working his way towards something all the time didn't know it. <clears throat> and uh, I would just like to give you what you want or what you need uh, in a way of feeding you or edifying you or exhorting or encouraging you are boosting you or helping you along the way, imparting a little uh, dynamic inertia to you toward Jesus and the kingdom. And uh, that must be done. My whole scheme of thought is based on utter freedom, my friends. Let me tell you that. And yet there are times and places for correction and rebuke, but I base everything on freedom, great freedom. I now know you'll never see God's glory in a social context that is unfree. He will not appear there. And those people that had the visitation in 46, in that glory, they were tremendously free. In fact, the freedom became the greatest problem. But be that as may, Jesus says, verse 46 of Luke 6, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now we're going to find the same message in James's first chapter. 
We may get to it and we may not. We may t attack it tomorrow night. We may lose it entirely like a nice fish. But that uh, doesn't matter, does it? Because the world is so old and there's been so many kinds of preaching and ministry done that I tell you, we just need to meet the Lord in a real and personal way. And as I meditated this afternoon and read the Bible, I read part of Luke's gospel and read some other things, I thought how profound and wonderful and sweet is the little fundamentalist saying, I have received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. How marvelous and satisfying is that phrase. Martin Luther tried for a long, long time to go to his father confessor, Reverend St uh, Dr. Staupitz, and recite every single sin he did and never got any relief and was told by the church doctors that if he didn't recite every one and visualize it, he couldn't get forgiveness for it. I have just received Jesus Christ, my personal Savior, into my heart. And I have got salvation by displacement. He came in and sin went out. Hallelujah. 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 If you want to illustrate this dramatically, draw a bathtub full of water, make it level full, and jump in. And you'll never forget the little truth I've just given you, salvation by displacement. <laughs> See, if I am five foot nine and a half and weigh 198 pounds, and Christ comes to me and he's five foot nine and a half and weighs 198, and he walks into me, all of me goes out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He says to us, verse 47, Whosoever cometh to me and... That's what we're doing tonight. We're coming to Jesus. They asked Jack Coe, what are you doing? I'm still coming to Jesus. Hallelujah. And heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is, a man, he is like a man who built an house and dug deep. And uh, I enjoyed Brother Tom's speech Sunday. Maybe I enjoyed it more than anybody else in the place. I think maybe I did. His sermon or teaching, or whatever you call it. He's rather different and offhand in the way he delivers things. And subtle. And when he read that, a question was asked in my spirit. How deep? Oh, you go to the uh, fundamentalist altar call and you, uh, you say certain things, you go through mechanics and that's it. It's, it's on an evening and it takes... A few seconds or a few minutes, and then you're done. Which can be criticized under the term of easy believism. How many know everything can get too easy? Where we're not really coming to grips with reality at all. That's the problem with European Lutheran state churchism. Is that right, Brother Hoyer? It's a trouble with uh, Calvinistic church state churchism. It's a trouble with broad Catholicism. Not so much of a trouble with Catholics, it is with Protestants. But it's a Protestant illness, easy believism. Your heart's not in it at all. You have a mild dread of hell and you go through a form and they tell you you're all right. Now I'm stirring up sediment. Praise the Lord. And that's all right, isn't it? If every sermon I ever preach makes everybody that ever hear me question whether they're saved or not, that'll be good, not bad. Because you've got to put your whole weight down on the Lord Jesus Christ and his substitutionary Amen. sacrifice uh, his vicarious atonement, you've got to trust him 100% for your salvation and deliverance from this evil world. Praise the Lord. But when, when Brother Tom read that scripture, it just very quickly, out of the depths of my being, shot up a question. How deep do you dig? That's a good, that's a good word, brother. And this is what uh, came up out. You dig infinitely deep. I was digging today, which is one reason I don't have a better sermon for you. I was digging today, digging down through the layers that history have thrown upon him, digging down through the 10,000 interpretations I face every day. I have entered into the realm of battling ideas over Jesus Christ, and I get hit by a lot of flying flag, but I'm still pressing toward him. You dig infinitely deep. You never stop digging. John's Gospel, Chapter 8. Hallelujah. My soul feels good about that. 
Let's look at John 8, 31. Well, let's look at 30 and 31. It illustrates what I've just been saying. It's, this, is, this is Bible, and this is the very voice of Jesus himself recorded by his best friend, John. As he spoke these words, this is John 8, 30, Many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, and as such unmanageable. <coughs> a man under the impact of a truth can seem a lot like a rebel. In church history is a series of a long string of accusations against God's true children on the part of church politicians who don't even believe in Jesus at all. It is a fact that leaders of movements, this is true of communism in Russia, it's been true of denominations, oftentimes the leaders themselves don't even believe and don't even care. Their business is running the machine and they feel res like very responsible men. I'm telling you the truth and that's a subject I'm going to quit right there. But that's something I've seen into. He is like a man who built an house and d dug deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Do you notice what it says? It doesn't say, and if a flood might arise. It says, when a flood arose. The Bible tells us with certainty that the flood is coming. And this all relates to the little passage uh, the little passage that we have uh, looked into in James. When a flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Is that not included in James chapter 1? He talks not only about uh, a certain mastery of, of soul and spirit and being and will, and being able to count things joy that to the ordinary mortal are not joy, but he also talks about a certain uh, endurance, a certain steadfastness, a certain stability, a certain eternality built in to the believer. Where he has one mind and his, motion, his emotions are under the command of the king. Oh, I regard emotion very highly. You, you have never met anybody who regards emotion as highly as I do. And how many have heard lots of statements in the charismatic time of 15 years? Uh, it's not by feeling all the statements against emotion. You ever hear them in preachers and teachers? I have. I don't want to annihilate emotion or stamp out emotion or quench emotion or, or starch it and get it in some hyper-ecclesiastical order. I want to see our feelings uh, related to and adjusted by Jesus Christ. It's a fact that the world runs by emotion, and emotion is mightier than will or intellect. Of that I am certain. And it's basic to it. Emotion gives rise to will, it gives rise to intellect. If I put them in a hierarchical order, I would put emotion as basic. When I was in my mother's arms, I was rocked in a sea of emotion, and I loved it. And I was a sensitive registrant. I knew when my mother was nervous and upset. Been a few times I probably wished I could go back to my mother's arms before I was verbal. How does she and I communicate when I didn't have language yet? Isn't a mother and a baby a powerful picture? Everybody gets moved, even hardened criminals, their hearts soften when they see a baby and a mother. And almost everybody in society will do everything they can to help a mother and, and her baby. The mother and child is a great motif in art. It will never get old. America shows a sickness because it has not liked the mother and babe in our last 10-year uh, period or 20-year period. 
and to the same degree that America brings it back, will be healthy. Children are the gift of the Lord, the Bible says. The old book will do a lot to adjust our thinking, won't it? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord's name. Hallelujah. 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 The old book teaches us about normalizing on the Christ line. That's what I call it. Jesus Christ is normal humanity, and God wants me to be like him. He thought so much of his mother, he could, he could uh, uh, control the pain of, of an agonizing death while he made provision for his mother down there. That's a lot of control, isn't it? To die a death beyond anything the world has ever known. We, I, I never even try to fathom Calvary's agony because I'm a million miles away from it. All I know, it, it, it was greater than anything man has ever known. And in the midst of that agony, Jesus uh, has a careful conversation with John and his mother to arrange for his mother. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. The storm beat vehemently upon that house, but could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. What's that rock's name? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Paul, by infinite divine authority, names him for us in the epistle to the Corinthians. That rock was Christ, he says. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. So Jesus' words here have a direct bearing upon James's words in James' epistle. <clears throat> praise the Lord tonight. Can you praise the Lord? My preaching contains the element of persuasion that our hearts might be won over to Jesus Christ. We become loyal subjects and devotees of his, that we will, with all of the fire of emotion, will and intellect, uh, we will will to build upon him and get close to him. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I suppose several years ago when God began to deal with me consciously about this scripture for the first time in my life, having read over it many times, I suppose my natural question was, how can we do that when it's not in our society to do that, when nobody in my family could ever do that? And I read far books of mystics like Brother Lawrence and Thomas Akempis and Meister Eckhart and others who said they could do it about a thousand years ago, but I never saw anybody do it. And Paul tells us in Romans 7 how frustrating uh, these things are in a passage Tom also read to us Sunday. <coughs> how can we do it? In the first place, when I read this verse, I'm reminded of a statement that Wade Taylor made to us at the end of the school year, and we enjoyed a marvelous atmosphere for many weeks, didn't we, Tom? We were living on what I call a high plateau of the spirit. We weren't experiencing sharp peaks and deep valleys, but we sat on a high plateau, which was moving ever upwards of spiritual blessing, and it almost seemed right that we would not let the students go home, but continue right through the summer. But, of course, we have an arrangement, we have a covenant, and we have a structure we have to abide by, which is everybody goes home on May the 20th. Mm -hmm. Even if God was getting ready to set the New Jerusalem down, we still have to go home and <laughs> put it off. <laughs> How many know about that spiritual putting off? Walter Butler told that one day God came down on him in his study. It was a Saturday, I think. And God began to give him a profound revelation of the name of Jesus. And God showed him all the ways we are not to use the name. He gave him a negative side of a revelation. And all of a sudden, Walter Buehler got restive and impatient. And they were having a picnic and a baseball game. And he said, oh, they're all out enjoying themselves in the sun. Here I am shut in. I'll go out and I'll get the rest of this some other time. Guess what? 
God never reinstituted those spiritual operations that would have given him the positive half concerning the name of Jesus. He, he, he went through life with one half of a revelation and never was it filled out. He terminated a precious divine operation that was a one-time only experience and told his students as a, as a lesson. Brother Taylor likes to talk about those that seek me early shall find me. When is early? Brother Taylor says it's an inconvenient time. <laughs> we will inconvenience, uh, or we, we, will, we will be inconvenienced for everybody but God. If we were in our closet in the midst of a divine dealing and a door bell rings or the phone rings or somebody screams, we leave. We have to find a people who will think more of God. One man said, Jesus, I will follow you. Just let me bury my father. Well, his father was still living, was going to live 30 more years. That's believed by most responsible scholars. Then after that's all done, I'll come and follow you. Well, by that time, Jesus went back to heaven. There are few who will follow Jesus, but many who can bury bodies. We have professional undertakers who make millions of dollars paid to do that. You can afford to break off the common activities of life and uh, seek the Lord and be his servant. Praise his name. Hallelujah. I heard a lot of words condemning those who are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Well, somebody please give me the book, the school, the course, how you get that way. <laughs> I tell you, if I could be heavenly minded, they could throw mud at me all the time. Because in the first place, I'd be in a perfect position to shrug it off like Jesus. As soon as anybody begins to rise off the earth that far, there's a squad that goes out with chains and they... <laughs> wrap them up and tie them to the earth. They're afraid somebody's going to go up. We can afford to lose one person out of the four and a half billion in the earth. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes, I said, uh, how can you do that? How can you count it all joy? Now, I, I said that something that Brother Taylor said has, is coming back to me and relating itself to this verse. Brother Taylor said right at the end of the school year, it could have been, oh, the week of graduation. He said, your alternatives, I'm talking to you now as individuals and to myself, because my voice reflects backwards down my throat as well as out of my mouth. It is our, it is our option, our, our alternatives are to become a victim or a creative force in this earth. We are all going to become either victims or creative forces. And when James says, count it all joy, that Greek word means to command with official authority. God's word tells us that it lies in our power somehow, in some mysterious way, which we don't grasp all that well, to regard the things that happen to us as either destructive or creative, or destructive or beneficial. And when you become negative in life, you find yourself building a tremendous list of destructive forces and experiences. And you keep chalking up the experiences of life to a, a destructive force, even in a phrase like, well, the devil made me do it, or the devil did that, or the people always harp on the devil's name. The devil's the main intervener in their life, according to them. And this verse says, brethren, you command with official authority the difficult trials of life into the category, the biblical, scriptural category set down by a man who grew up in a house with Jesus of Nazareth under a father called Joseph and a mother called Mary. He says, put it under the category of all joy. We may be talking about a biblical discipline. We all know, we've been told, 
We're not too masterful that there are disciplines in the spiritual life. I tried a discipline. I tried a discipline for the last three days. I had a, a special reason. It came to me and I said, all right, I'm going to do that. And I did it. I, I exercised myself in a spiritual discipline from Friday to Monday, which was about three and a half days. And I believe I can see where it bore heavenly fruit in this earth. The kind of fruit Jesus says remains because it springs out of eternal soil. It's got heaven mixed up in it. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and so that's the disciplinary side. I had to get baptized in water years before I could understand it. Does that seem right or wrong? To scientific man, he would say, well, you shouldn't have done anything until you understood it. Well, I still wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> An old man baptized me and he said, you'd under understand what's happening now. You'll understand it later. Jesus said that to his disciples one day in John's Gospel. Hallelujah. Well, there's a key. There are, there are a lot of keys in the Bible to this. Praise the Lord. And uh, I have felt shot through these last few years with a tremendous confidence for the Church of Jesus Christ. I believe God's going to do wonderful things in us and through us. And there's a key in verse 3. Count it all joy and you, and you fall into various trials, knowing... There are two ways to enter into trials, knowing or not knowing, in a knowing state or an unknowing state. In a, in, a, in a somnolent state of sleep, lethargy, with a general mind of, of this world, or you can enter into the various trials in what we can call the revelatory state that is natural to new creation man. Now James tells us knowing, and then he gives us uh, one plain reason. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And patience is a powerful virtue. Can you say amen? amen. Some man said patience is a fruit that grows very sparingly in most people's orchards. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Your amen is... Lifted the burden of guilt from my shoulders. I should have been the one to say amen. I get angry very quickly. And I'm very irritable. So I need this. <laughs> I need this. I've been considering it for years. And uh, I'm still coming to Jesus. What, what for? I come to Jesus for forgiveness of my failures. He gives me a clean slate. I start all over again. I talked to Brother Parkins a year or so ago about forgiveness. He says, I think there's a better way, which is the way of obedience. But he said, for me, it's had to be the way of forgiveness. But some people have so much personal pride, if they can't go the way of perfect obedience, they won't go at all and they damn their souls. <laughs> My friends, we must stand on the power of the word of forgiveness. That was the strength of Luther's a uh, tremendous uh, movement in this world and the word he uttered really what he released was the power of the word of forgiveness over European society praise the Lord that's preaching for me not you I feel like saying amen to it because <laughs> I know it's true hallelujah <clears throat> and the first reason James gives us is and you can make a whole list by going through the biblical text from Genesis to Revelation, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And then he says, let patience have her perfect work or her full outworking that ye may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Apparently we're seeing contrasted here uh, magic and process. God works how many of you know that God works in sudden onsets of power, which we characterize as the miracle? How many have ever been touched uh, suddenly and mightily and decisively by God's power? Put your hand up. You experienced a sudden healing. A 
And dynamite is sudden and decisive and sharp, pointed. It's a point action. And then there's another side of God where he initiates his work and then freely and in total confidence uh, gives his work over to the process of God, which we could generally term sanctification. It can be called, in, in a profound way, Christian education, not what they're doing out there, but what God does by the Holy Spirit. How I many know there is one teacher, his name is the Holy Ghost? Amen. That's why J John says you need not that any man teach you. Even if there is a man, it's the Holy Ghost doing it. Amen. And it doesn't make us recalc refractory loners that won't hear anybody, but we recognize the Holy Spirit speaking in and through various men and women. Praise God. Uh, we find that this process in which the active agent or the minister of the handmaiden is called patience brings us to a place, James says, where you are perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Why? That's a kind of perfection appearing in time. A full-grown man or woman of God. Lacking nothing. God's word says the possibility exists. It may not occur too often, but the possibility exists. It's a kind of a practical, down-to-earth, uh, Jacobian perfectionism. Nothing grandiose or high-flown. And uh, when I think about this scripture, I realize that there are, there are many revelatory facts or facts pertinent to salvation in the Bible that uh, would persuade us to count it all joy. We may look at a few of those. Uh, a very basic and evident one is found in the Petrine epistle. Let me look it up. It's First Peter 4.10, I think. Just a... Uh, a divine and scriptural symmetry is found here. Hallelujah. First Peter 4.10. Yes, that's the verse I want. You find a, a symmetry and an, an answering, an echo or a, a parallelism here. I just want you to look for this uh, revelatory reason from Holy Writ that you find in verse number two various trials that's uh, manifold tests or temptations porkiloi peirosmoi uh, manifold tests in James 1 3 and in 1 Peter 4 10 you find a phrase manifold grace so I would tend to think that in, in making columns uh, you have a trial here and a grace that answers to it here. A, a trial and its appropriate grace. The test and God's answer to it in the inward depths of your being. Amen. Or even an outward stroke of miracle at times perhaps. Amen. Many, many fiery trials, many graces or a manifold, a many-sided grace. One side of uh, which grace answers to one of those problems you get into. Today as I was uh, reading Luke and reading some of other authors, uh, got a Keswick book out, the ministry of Keswick, and was reading some East Stanley Jones and other things, and reading in the old West Saxon Gospel of John, which Brother Hoyer lent me. All of a sudden I felt... I'm going to receive a, a little clear direction from God now. I just felt something creeping up on me. And uh, it, it formed in my mind. It was in a piece of advice of, by Paul to Timothy. He says, give attention to reading. And uh, that came to me quite clearly. And then the overshadowing presence of God witnessing to it. To my amazement, I pick up the Keswick book, open it up, a book printed in England and London, and I saw their seal and motto has that very scripture on it. Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to teaching. So God spoke to me clearly and says, give attention to reading. Keep taking in. Have a rich input. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Now I get slaughtered by lots of books I read. They really, it's like getting into a, too close to an explosion of something. But yet, in every book I've read, I've got something precious, like a nugget. I have grasped something valuable, so that the trial was worth the possession. And the very hard trial made the possession all the more precious and valuable. Praise God. God speaks so easily and so clearly. God's children do not normally walk in a fog of confusion. They walk in a crystal clear light that exploded out of Calvary's passion to make us know what we're supposed to do. I know what God's will is for my life. When I get rebellious and go crazy, then I don't know. I'm a wild, raging maniac. <laughs> I want to go other places and do other things and forget about my family and not preach for a while. But when I'm in my right mind, see, I, I contrast two states. Now, the state of faith and a state of unbelief. Have you noticed how different you are when you're in a state of faith and when you're in a state of unbelief? How many have noticed how different you are? I call that state taking an Adamic fit. You know, we revert uh, from our normal new creation state into what I call taking a temporary Adamic And a man like that's dangerous. Like they tell me some Christians cuss even when they get that way. It's not characteristic and I, it doesn't prove to me they're not Christians either. It's a relapse. Falling into uh, the wrong nature and being motivated from the wrong source. But the Word of God helps us, doesn't it? Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise is always in order. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord, and magnify your name. We exalt you above all others. Glory be to God. We thank you, Lord, and praise you. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> Today, for the first time, I thought of this passage, counted all joy. I thought of it in relation to a saying by Paul for the first time, and I realized that Paul and James are saying almost the same thing. Uh, let's just uh, look at this again, verses 2, 3, and 4. <clears throat> we need more repetition in the church or in our movement we tend to demand a tremendous level of spontaneous inspiration and artistic achievement in preaching whereas Peter and Paul both talk about how they repeated 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 Jesus was repetitive like the rabbis and rabbinical learning was by verbal or uh, audible repetition in the classroom and so I'm going to read these three verses again my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the test the testing of your faith produces patience but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire lacking nothing now I'm going to open my Bible to Romans chapter 5 which is one of the most marvelous Pauline passages <clears throat> any Christian who spends a lot of time in the book of Romans will be doing themselves a favor and glorifying God you hear that I never realized by, before how how almost identical are, are, is the Jacobean and the Pauline passages we have under our uh, consideration tonight James 1 Romans 5 Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith. Notice the Pauline weight on faith. There's special emphasis on these words. John Wright Follett made much of word emphasis. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Do you see how congruent this is with James? James tells, to achieve this, you've got to be rock-like and have just one mind, not two minds. He talks about the dipsukoi, the dipsukos individual who has two different minds or two different souls. When Jesus Christ has his way with you, he gives you one mind, and it's called the mind of Christ. 
I don't have the mind of Satan or the mind of Adam or the mind of the flesh or the mind of the 20th century. I have one mind, the mind of Christ. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What great words. Faith, grace, standing, hope, and glory. Well, there's a sermon, a sermonic material for one of the great Englishmen who are masters of this sort of thing. Even some of us feeble folk could do quite a bit with it, no doubt. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. In tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. <laughs> and then James says, patience worketh you. <laughs> In other words, the only divine agent to make us lies on the other side of a meeting with tribulation. <laughs> And patience experience. The only kind of a person who cannot profit by experience is a psychotic. And that's a mark of a psychotic. They will not and cannot learn from experience. That's a mark, an earmark of a psychotic. That means a sick soul. Twisted soul, distorted soul. Tribulation worketh patience. Patience worketh experience. Experience worketh hope. And now we're up to an eternal level. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, Now by the faith and hope and love, the three so-called theological virtues who go with us from this life and this way of being into the eternal state. My gift of prophecy doesn't go with me, Paul says. But my faith, hope, and love goes with me. Praise God. And hope maketh not ashamed. Unashamed hope. I believe one of the prime uh, root uh, psycho-spiritual ills of the American people is they are a people who do not hope. The effect of affluence is to make a people quit hoping. Whitaker Chambers says, we of the West are too well off to know what hope is. But in Russia and China and other places, those people have been reduced to hope. And as such, they are psychologically far sounder than we are. Hope makes you sane. Dr. F uh, Victor Frankl based the Third Viennese School of Psychology entirely on having a hope for the future. He calls it logotherapy. Logos means meaning. Those who go insane do so because they have lost hope for the future. Those who have a passionate hope for the future will not go crazy. And they will live through uh, prisoner of war experiences. Dr. Frankel went into the German prison camps because he was a Jew, and only one out of 28 lived, and he lived because he had hope. And he said he saw time and again, being a medical doctor and a psychologist, the Nazis used him to minister to the people in the camps, and he said, I saw over and over again that the very moment that a man lost hope, he died. Very soon thereafter. One group had uh, got a rumor that they were going to get liberated by Christmas 1940. Christmas of 1940, two or three or four, I forget which year it was. Liberation didn't come. And when Christmas went, a whole bunch of people suddenly died in that prison camp. Some others had another revelation that salvation was coming on a certain date. When it didn't come, a whole flock of them died, just like that. But everyone who had a powerful future hope was able to endure the uh, extreme stress of the prisoner of war experience in World War II. Hallelujah. Communists. And the Allies found out something out of the Korean War. That when the Communists took the United Nations prisoners, Americans, <clears throat> Germans, French, English, others, <clears throat> and they uh, submitted, subjected them to the brainwashing techniques, there were three classes of people that the Russians couldn't break down, or the North Koreans or the Communists. 
Orthodox Jews who were fanatics, devout Catholics who were fanatics, and rabid fundamentalists, Protestants who were fanatics. Those three classes stood against brainwashing. Hallelujah. Praise God. So my friends, we're dealing with basic issues here tonight. We don't know what's coming. God's getting us ready for something. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Now let me uh, go back to the beginning of Paul's statement here and, and notice something. I feel like saying praise the Lord tonight. Amen. I hope I don't let, end up my life in a prisoner of war camp, but if I do, hope I remember what I'm teaching tonight. <laughs> do it with grace. <clears throat> I dreamed I was in one recently, and I was very happy. I was free in there. I went around trying to get somebody to bind me, and they all ignored me. So, anyway... <laughs> now, uh, what we're talking about here is facing the fallen structures of existence. We are talking about the various trials. Where do they come from? They come out of the world in its fallen state. We do not know what it's like to live in paradise. <laughs> Most of you had to go to jobs last week or last month. You did not pick pineapples or pears and apples and peaches and plums uh, in the paradise garden and go in your house at dinner time and do no work. And every time you ate, you just go out and pick the fruit that pr the earth produces of itself, the Bible says. I'm glad I live on a lively ball like this. It produces of itself. And in paradise, you just go pick everything. No, uh, we came under a curse. The earth was cursed and Adam's cursed. And so there's labor now to eat. <clears throat> so these various trials spring out of the very uh, innermost reality of fallen, the structures of fallen existence. And now Paul's telling us, he's telling us a little secret here, a revelatory secret. You know, this tremendous, isn't Christianity tremendous? Yeah. We believe and have some evidence that it is really humanity's answer, but much of the world won't take it. Christianity is like communism. It's an open conspiracy. This great gold nugget fell down from heaven and lies on the surface, and everybody passes by it. They don't grasp it. And we have to preach and labor and exhort and persuade people to take this great gift. <clears throat> which not only saves you from hell in the future, but it changes life so much now, you may think you're in paradise at times. How many ever thought of Holy Ghost marriage? What? Marriage restored in the lives of the redeemed back to better than what Adam and Eve knew. Experiencing androgynous wholeness, having the mind of Christ and the husband and wife both, and having a full expression of man. <laughs> At his human divine best. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Not preaching about marriage. <laughs> but Paul says, therefore being justified. I like the old Anglo Saxon word in the, in the, the German theologian, having been right wised by faith. <laughs> in old Saxon, the word is right is Ritwiesnisse. Right wiseness. <laughs> That's what righteousness is. Having been set right. Having the kingdom come as a great overshadowing force and rectified things in your life. Put you into an eternal adjustment with the Father up there who then looks down and may daringly adjust all things in the earth to you. Why, one of his men one day look up and says, Son, stand still. An audacious move even for a man of God. And God must have liked that because God complied and froze the cosmic processes and the universe stood still for a period of time, about a whole day, I believe the Bible says. Praise God. When mortal man, who's used to slogging through the muck and the mire of manifold trials, and Joshua pastoring three million had trials. How many know he had trials? Like Moses, he inherited Moses' trials. And one day he looked up and spoke to the, the great flaming orb in the sky and said, Stand still. And it stood still. Because he got in tune with the throne. We're talking tonight about getting in tune with the throne of God. 
getting adjusted to eternal realities and seeing the great uh, master of it all adjusting earthly realities to you. Oh, how many times I've seen divine providence work in my life in an astounding manner. I've received rich gifts and blessings and met unusual people and, and knew it could only be due to God's uh, activity of divine providence uh, in my life. Praise God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we can count them all joy knowing this revelatory fact. You see, it takes fantastic energies to successfully face the world in its uh, incalculable stresses that are set up since Satan's rebellion and Adam's fall. But it is precisely the Christian who has got rid of the guilt from his sins that has the level of energy who could face it successfully. Paul says, being justified, now we have peace. And peace is power. Amen. The worldling is still being eaten alive by either conscious or unsubconscious guilt over his sins. The Christian who gets cleansed by the precious blood of the Lamb can shed that guilt. And now we are the world, we are the potential world conquerors. Amen. You see, the world element we move through is dense. It's like lead. And I believe that the atmosphere of the world is denser now than it ever has been. In other words, the general uh, zeitgeist, the spirit of the time, the spirit of the age, the general generated atmosphere of all of the battling spiritual forces in the world is, is, is very, very uh, dense and very compressed and very tight. And it takes tremendous struggle to get through it. Now let me refer to a couple statements of Jesus. This is very... Uh, illustrative for our purpose tonight. We'll look in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter in at the narrow gate, or I'll use the older words, Enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which who go in that way. Because uh, narrow is the gate, and hard is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The famous passage illustrating the straight and the narrow. <clears throat> and the word under the term uh, narrow or straight here, straight in verse 13, means restrained. It means to keep out or to keep back. And the term under... The narrow way in verse 14 means compressed. One way to uh, put these words into a modern phrasing is contracted by pressure. Compressed. And compressed means to crowd everything into a smaller space. I believe one of the faults in the church today, one of the problems is the Christians have compressed minds. They have allowed the forces of this age to shrink their horizons, and their thinking is small and cramped. This all links together. But there's a statement in, in, uh, in Acts here, in chapter 14, uh, verse 22, which has been repeated a lot in Pinecrest, Acts 14, 22. Paul says, or it says about Paul and his party, they were confirming the souls of the disciples, Acts 14, 22. 
and exhorting them to continue in the faith. You see it there. Continue in the faith. And they were exhorting them that we must through much tribulation, flipsis, which means affliction or pressure. And the modern word for it would be stress. We must through much pressure enter into the kingdom of God. According to Paul and Jesus, there isn't any way in apart from a, a real narrowing and a, and a pressurizing, a constricting, a contracting. The straight and the narrow, the restrained and the compressed, they contracted by pressure. Hallelujah. Count it all joy. Why? Because we know that this is the only way into the kingdom, and we're in it. Jesus said, I am the way. Praise God. And so I believe what James is talking about is a creative use of the trials of life, a creative treatment that when faith and pressure meet, there is a dynamic chemistry set up that puts us into the kingdom of God. It gives us divine realization. The Bible says in Genesis, uh, in the, uh, it says something here. Let me just take a glance at the second chapter of Genesis, I believe. <clears throat> God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In what image and likeness was God appearing in Genesis chapter uh, 1? He's appearing under the guise of the Creator. El, Elohim, the creating God. So man is made in the image of a Creator. Therefore, man is also a Creator, a sub-Creator, a co-Creator. Man is creative. And James is talking about a creative approach to the difficulties of life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And he says, if any like wisdom, if any of you like wisdom, it would be wisdom to take the creative approach, and it would be unwisdom to take the modern view, which is destructive in its outcome which issues in everlasting complainings, grumblings, murmurings, negative confessions, and strife and confusion in the local churches and in the families. So wouldn't it be a blessing if we could glorify God by adopting James's little humble, direct, and forceful spiritual advice to count it joy and as a discipline to most of all when we're under trial worship God then and to praise Him more uproariously and perhaps do our best dancing just when we're feeling our worst. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise the name of the Lord. Can you praise God tonight? I think that I shall refrain from going on into the uh, further verses of chapter 1. And I believe I've talked enough tonight. And I believe we'll just sing a nice crisp song and leave. Hallelujah.